today we want to recognize the awesome privilege that God has given us as mothers, life bearers, um, to contribute, contribute to, um, to generations. And um, today I'm going to talk about the heart of a true mother. And I'm going to be taking it from an Old Testament scripture. It's kind of an unusual story, but if you follow me, then you'll see where it's going. But for me, all mothers are special and seem to have some kind of superpower. I was watching a mother yesterday who was trying to fix something, and while she was fixing something, the baby started to drag something, so she was fixing that, then she'd done something like that, you know, like uh, the Matrix. And I said, girl, you got superpowers. Because as a mother, you have to have superpowers, you know? As a child, can you remember thinking that your mum really did have eyes in the back of her head? She knew what you was doing, even when you pretended that you weren't. When she called you and said, what are you doing? Nothing. She knew exactly what you was doing. And most mothers know the character of their children, don't you? You can see it in them from quite a young age if they're outgoing, gregarious, laid back, or if they're a little bit of a gin or. <laughs> Got any of those in your family? They start very young, but you think, mm-mm. They're, they're trying to gin on me already. <laughs> I don't have any um, slides, so you might want to take some notes as we go along. I'm doing the old-fashioned way today with some paper, but it's okay. But as we said earlier, there are many types of mothers. There's mothers by nature and mothers by nurture. And mothers by nurture have never given birth, but are true mothers because of the loving hearts and the nurturing spirit that they have. And today we talked about different mothers, stepmothers, adoptive mothers, foster mothers, aunties, grandmothers, community mothers. Who remembers the community mothers when you were young, that any kids can come in the house and they would get food and they would be protected and everybody was safe? I think Mummy Wade was probably one of those mothers where just community mothers, every child was their child, that kind of open heart. And I think the older generation was a bit like that, weren't they? My dear aunt is one of those women who are woman, a mother by nurture. Um, she didn't give birth to any biological children, biological children, but she's now 97 years old and she's as sharp as a razor in her mind. It really is. And from the age of six, she kind of took me under her wings and she taught me some principles about sacrifice and success. And she demonstrated that it's not always how you start in life that matters, but how you finish. That's what really matters. Because we're all on a journey, and we all have obstacles that we have to navigate. But it's how we finish that really matters. So whenever I see my aunt, we still have wonderful, inspiring conversations and belly laughs. We just love a laugh. And we look at old times and we reminisce about the good times and always just looking for the funny reasons to laugh. And spending time with her is jokes, as the young people today would say, it's, it's jokes. We just find so much time to laugh and that's just a wonderful thing. And we know that it really takes a village to raise a child. We say that, but in reality, can you remember growing up and meeting your parents' friends and people that came to the home and just how they impacted you, an auntie, a school teacher, you know, just how they treated you, it has impacted you. Maybe it was 20 years ago, 30, 40, even 50 years ago, but you still remember. You remember their name and you remember how they made you feel because they had a positive impact on you. And that's why we're saying it takes a village. Some of us, we just see the kids running around and we think, Oh, they're just kids, but no, we're impacting them by everything that we do. How we respond to them, how we greet them, how we share our lives with them, how we communicate with them, it is really important. We all contribute to the life of a child, not just the, the um, biological mothers. So to successfully raise our children, we need God's wisdom, yeah? So I just want to go into that unusual story that I'm talking about. And it's about uh, two mothers in a, a dispute 
about their motherhood. And it's a passage taken from 1 Kings chapter 3. And it starts with King Solomon as a young king. King David has just died, and Solomon is now on the throne. He's about 20 years old, so he's a very, very young king. And he is a righteous king. His heart is for the Lord, and God sees that. And he offers extravagant offerings before God. He goes to the uh, altar, and he offers a thousand burnt offerings and peace offerings, and he just lavishes these offerings on God. And God was pleased with Solomon, and he went to sleep that night, and God appeared to him in his sleep. And he said, Solomon, what do you want? Just ask me anything. It's an, a blank check. Just write on it what you will, and you can have it. Can you imagine that? God just coming to you and saying, anything, just, just name it, anything you want, you can have it. And this is what Solomon said. He said to God, you know, you've been great to my father David. You've blessed him. My father served you faithfully. And now me as a young person, I'm now on the throne as a king. I don't know enough. But this is what I want you to do. In verse 9 of that same chapter, he says, give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? Isn't that beautiful? Who by themselves can govern this great people of yours? What I love is that bit of yours. He didn't see the people as his to do as he wanted. He realized that they were God's people. And he needed the wisdom to know how to govern these people, how to treat them right. Because sometimes when people are in positions of power, they start to think it's about them and it's about what they can get from people. But he said, God, I want to know how I can treat your people right, how I can govern them right. So just give me that understanding heart for the people. So the Lord was pleased with Solomon, verse 10 and asked that he had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you've asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or will ever have. I will also give you what you didn't ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Isn't it amazing? So even the things that he didn't ask for, because God could trust his heart, he said, I'm going to give you those things because you could have asked for wealth and fame and power and to destroy your enemies, but you didn't ask for those things, even though you probably needed some of those things, but you didn't ask for that. You asked for an understanding heart, for wisdom, and God gave him everything. And that reminds me of the scripture that talks about seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So God was saying, Solomon, you take care of my business, and I'm going to take care of yours. And it's the same God, and it's the same principle. When we see God's business, God's kingdom business as a priority, God will never leave us short. He will take care of us. So after Solomon asks for that prayer, um, asks in prayer, and God gives him that, you know that whatever you receive, there's a time for testing, yeah? Now his wisdom is going to be tested, and he's going to find out, does he really have the wisdom that God says he has? So we go down into the passage, into verse 16, where it says, sometime later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. So I'll read that again. Two prostitutes came.
came to the king to have an argument settled. You're thinking to yourself, am I in church still? Look around. Are you in church? Okay. That's one thing I love about the Bible. It just tells it as it is. It ain't prettying it up. It's just telling you what it is. Two prostitutes came. Now, what's interesting about that first verse is that as a king, you have protocols. Not everybody can come in front of the king. If you wanted to see King Charles, what's your chances? How much red tape do you need to go through? All next year this time, you're trying and you still can't see King Charles. And it wasn't much different for Bible kings as well. They had advisors. They had governors, they had the government, they had people around them. And they had other officers um, that were seeing the people. The Jethro model, where he said to Moses, you know, find people that can deal with this, you know, what's happening in the community. Because you can't do it all. Come. There was millions of people in Israel. How could King Solomon see everybody? So I then think to myself, how did these women get to see the king? I imagine they may have gone to the county court and those guys couldn't handle it. It may have gone to the magistrate's court and they couldn't handle it. Then it may have gone to the crown court. Not even they could handle it. Now it's come to the supreme court in front of King Solomon. And as a king, he could have thought, I ain't gonna see those women. I don't have time for that. I need to be entertaining dignitaries. I need to be entertaining important people. I need to be entertaining, you know, my generals and of my army and all of these people that are keeping my kingdom together. But King Solomon allowed these women to come into his presence. You know, this is ancient Israel and prostitution is frowned on in every generation. Even today in our society, we're kind of anything goes society. But even in our society, it's still frowned on, isn't it? And we're talking about 3,000 years ago in ancient Israel, where technically these women were making a living out of breaking every commandment of God. They were making a living out of breaking the commandments. But here they were in front of King Solomon. And it just kind of reminds me of the scripture where it talks about let us come boldly before the throne of grace. And why I'm saying that is sometimes when we're reading the Old Testament, you know, at Bible school you're taught, when you're reading the Old Testament, you need to look for Christ in there. You need to look for, for the redemption work of Christ in the Old Testament because what is in the Old Testament concealed is in the New Testament revealed. So there is a redemptive work that's taking place from the Old Testament. There's hints that God is showing us about what he is willing and will be doing in our lives. And that's what I see, that Solomon allows these women to come before him. He's not looking at their background. There are citizens of his kingdom, and he's given them an audience with him. So this is... Solomon's test of his wisdom. So we'll get back to verse 6. Some time later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. And next verse. One woman said, Please, my lord, one of them began. This woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone in the house. There was no one in there with us, just the two of us. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over it. Now, it's a common practice, isn't it, when you have a new baby that you take the baby into your bed, isn't it? Even though midwives and doctors are warned you, don't ever bring a newborn baby into bed with you because of that reason. But we still did it, didn't we? 
you still cuddled up next to the baby, breastfed them, then you fell asleep, the baby fell asleep, then you woke up a few hours later, then you fed them again, and so forth. Because it's almost a natural instinct. I find that when you have a child, don't you find that you sleep a little lighter? So when you hear a little, mm, you wake. <laughs> Just a little, well, some mothers. <laughs> some are still. <laughs> <laughs> but most mothers, you're kind of just a little bit more sensitive. But in this case, it appears that this mother had fallen asleep heavily and had somehow smothered her baby, which is a real tragedy. And it has happened in life. I actually know somebody that this happened to. I spoke to her. It wasn't her that did this. It was a, she had a teenage son that was sleeping in a bed with her and this new baby. And unfortunately, in the morning, the baby had been smothered by the teenage son who was sleeping heavily. Tragedy. But these things do happen, and that's why we're usually told, don't do it. So the woman continues. This is in front of King Solomon. Then she got up in the night, took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms, took mine to sleep beside her. In the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. So she was addressing the king. Then the other woman interrupted her. It certainly was your son, and the living child is mine. So she didn't address the king in any way. She just attacked this woman. Now the first woman said, the living child is mine and the dead one is yours. And so they argued back and front before the king. So the king was watching this drama unfold in front of him. It was your son that died. No, it was mine that was alive and yours is dead. And no, yours is dead and mine is alive. Can you imagine just arguing in front of the king? It was a real drama. Maybe like a Jerry Springer moment. <laughs> Who is the father? <laughs> so then the king said, okay, let, hold on a minute. Let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child is yours and each of you say the dead one belongs to the other. Now, we're living in times where we have things like DNA testing and blood tests and all of that, but in that time, there was no such thing. There was no way you could tell. Just the two of them in the house. There were no witnesses. Nobody to say, I saw the child. There was no family photos, no mobile phones to take a snapshot as a child's born to say, see, that was him. Nothing like that. It was just, she said, she said. That's all it was. That's all the king had to go by. And they both sounded really convincing. Have you ever been in a situation where you've heard two sides of the story? And they are both so convincing. The complete opposite. I've been in that position many times, and I think, Lord, help me. Because everyone is so convinced of their situation. So the king had a dilemma. He was thinking, what am I going to do? And then he says, all right, bring me a sword. You can hear everyone go, <gasps> and hold their breath. The king has asked for a sword. What's going to happen? So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, cut the living child in two. Give half to one mother and half to the other mother. Silence. But then a voice echoes across the room. No, my lord. Give her the child. Let her have the child. Please don't kill him.
But the other woman said, let him be neither yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Cut him down the middle. You have one eye, one hand, and one feet. <laughs> My Lord, my Lord. Then the king said, don't kill the child. Give it to the woman who told you to give it to the, uh, because she's the real mother. A mother's heart would never allow her child to be slain. A mother's heart could never allow her child to die. She would rather give up her child than to see her child harm. Solomon understood the true heart of a mother. And that was his first test of his wisdom. God's given wisdom. Only God alone could have given him that wisdom to know the true heart of a mother. And the last verse said, when all of Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. That made national news. You know, news at 10? National news. They didn't have TVs or mobile phones, but it says, when all Israel heard. I imagine during the time when they were going to the smaller courts that people probably heard oh you heard about those two women that go into the different courts so by the time they'd got to the supreme court it was news throughout israel so everybody was waiting what's going to happen what's the king going to do in fact it made international news because we understand a few years later that the queen of sheba came to see king solomon when she heard about his wisdom and she came bringing gifts, gold, and treasures to the king. Now, Solomon understood the heart of a mother because his own mother, Bathsheba, had pleaded his cause in securing the kingdom before David's death. Because David had many sons, and Solomon was one of the younger ones. So he technically was not really supposed to inherit the throne. But David's other sons were disqualified because they were evil. And God had specifically said to David, I've chosen Solomon to reign after you. He will be king. And Bathsheba knew that. And before David died, one of his other sons was setting himself up to be king and gathering people around him. And Bathsheba went to see David. And when I read that, it was quite amazing because Bathsheba's David's wife. But it says that when she came in, she bowed herself to the ground before him and said, oh my Lord, I know your brothers like that part, isn't it? <laughs> she bowed before him. I was like, but it's your husband, isn't it? But she did. On a couple of occasions I wrote, and whenever she, she was approaching the king, because that's how you approach kings, the fact that she was married to him didn't really matter. She bowed before him and said, my Lord, God has told you that your son Solomon would be king. And she reminded him, set your house in order. You brothers are drooling now, isn't it? <laughs> no sovereign nation women them t over there them times. So she had pleaded Solomon's cause because one of the older sons were already setting himself up and she knew that had they become king, her and Solomon would die because they would put them to death as a threat to the throne. So, Solomon knew that his mother would plead his cause and that she would be trying to secure his future. So he understood the heart of these mothers. And interesting thing is, as well, his mother Bathsheba had a slightly shady past too, as we know, with King David. But that didn't disqualify her. She was now the mother of a king. And that's what I see when I... Look at this story, God's redemptive work, even in the Old Testament. That no matter what our past is, we can come before the king. We can come boldly before his throne. There is grace there 
as there were grace for these two mothers, these prostitutes, King Solomon allowed them into his presence. And he dealt with them with honor, with respect, with dignity, and with grace. And that's where we see God's redemption working. And the interesting thing, when Solomon said, bring me the sword, he used a sword, not as an instrument to divide, but to discern. How beautiful is that? It was an instrument of discernment, not of division, as the other mother had called for it to be, to divide the child. But it was to discern the intents of their hearts. And in the scriptures it says, the, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's exactly what the sword did. The mother shouted, Oh my Lord, no! Don't kill him. Give him to her. So her heart was discerned that she was the true mother. And the imposter said, Use the sword and cut him in two. So the sword did its work on both sides. And that's the power of the word of God. It's there to discern our hearts and to transform us. So as believers, whenever we face issues that need wisdom, we should always say, bring me the sword. That should settle the matter, shouldn't it? We got a dispute? Bring me the sword. You got marital problems? Bring me the sword. Yes, the sword will discern our hearts and makes things right. So I'd like to share a few observations with you of the other mother. And when we read, take a note of what jumps up at you, what you, you know, what it is that you're getting from this. So this is some of the things that I observe. We can learn a lot from the second mother, not just from the story about how she switched the babies, but more about her character. She had a disregard for truth. You know, the Bible says that the truth sets us free. She had a total disregard for the truth. She was in denial. She didn't care who she hurt in her pursuit to get her way. She was in a place of denial, not wanting to accept the reality of her loss. And we can empathize, her loss was painful. But instead she chose to inflict the pain and grief onto the other mother. Instead of taking responsibility for her own doing, she sought to blame others and to rob them of their joy. Choosing rather to live with the deception without counting the cost to others. Her own self-interest was greater than the life of the child. In essence, she was saying, if I can't have a baby, neither should you. Cut him in half. I can't have him, why should you have him? That jealousy, envy. Jealousy and envy are sly demons that can poison the minds of so many of us when we don't have what we wish that we had. Can we get real today? Jealousy can make you hate a person even though they never did anything to you. Just because you have what they wanted. Jamaican people call it bad mind. There's a song saying, you're too bad mind. You're too bad mind. Because that's what it is. 
it can, it can make us allow somebody or something to die just so that we can say, we got what we wanted. There's a scripture in Songs of Solomon 8.6 that says, Love is stronger than death, and jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And we can see it, see it in operation in this situation. So we've got to check our hearts, check our motive. Can we not rejoice when other people succeed? Can we be happy for other people's prosperity? Does other people's prosperity take anything from us? No. The Bible says that we must rejoice with those that rejoice. And let's weep with those that weep and mourn. She could have come to a conclusion in the morning and wept with her friend. They could have wept together for the baby. And she could have supported her through her grief. And she could have helped to raise the boy that was alive and be part of that village and just have that positive effect. May God help us that we will not allow envy and jealousy to rob us and to rob others too. So let's reflect on the true mother. These are my observations. The true mother knew her child was not dead, regardless of what was being said. She knew in her heart her child wasn't dead. She stood firmly in her rightful position as the mother of that child, but was willing to give him up to preserve his life. That's the heart of a mother. Some mothers have had to give up their children for so many reasons, but it was for love. We have learned that not only does a true mother know her child, but a true mother will sacrifice for her child. Nothing will be too difficult for a mother to do. If there's one meal, the mother will let the child eat the meal and she will watch, and her belly will feel full, just knowing that the child's belly full. That's, that's the love of a mother. Mothers of every generation have sacrificed careers, luxuries and comforts for the benefit and well-being of their children. Every generation. I can imagine my parents' generation and the generation before that, that had little, but they were comforted in knowing that their children had a roof over their head, a meal in their belly. So in conclusion, this message is not just about a true mother or how to identify the mother who should be honored or the one who should be condemned. If the truth be told, we could probably all relate to one or both of the mothers in some way. In our own lives or maybe in the lives of somebody that we know. But if you know, if you didn't know of God's love and you didn't know that God was a provider and you saw somebody with something that you wanted, maybe you would have a tinge of jealousy. But your God is a provider. He will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. The Bible also said he will not withhold any good thing from us. So the important thing is that we know when things don't turn out the way that we want them to, that God is our source, that he's our provider in everything, and that we know where to go. We go to the throne, we go to the king, we take it to the Lord in prayer and allow him to work it out for us. So mothers need to seek godly wisdom in raising their children. The true mother knew where to turn to in times of desperation. She went to the throne, and that throne is still available today. It's on your knees. It's on your knees in God's presence. And most of mother's battles are won on their knees. Not fighting, she said, she said, he said. Not in that. On our knees is where many battles are fought. And the wonderful thing about mother's prayers is that they outlive you. Some mothers never see the things that they've prayed for in their children. 
and they've gone. But you know, one day you hear a testimony of somebody saying, you know what? My mother was praying for me. I was out there in the world doing my thing. But I wish mom was alive today to see that her prayers are answered. Our prayers outlive us. And we learn from the text that even a true mother isn't perfect. She's not flawless. She doesn't always do everything right. She may even have a shady past. But when we receive the word of the king, he established us in our rightful position. And that's what matters. The Bible has never shied away from telling the truth about where people are coming from. It doesn't try to whitewash or sanitize the realities of the human struggle. However, it always shows the redemptive nature of God. God doesn't see us as we are, but as we shall be. As we shall be. And when we think of the other Old Testament scriptures like Rahab, who was a prostitute too, but God redeemed her. And she became the great-great-grandmother of King David, King Solomon's great-great-grandmother. God has a redemptive way of changing our lives. When we come as we are, just come and be honest. Come before the king with an open and honest heart. That's what God desires from us. Even Jesus' genealogy is sprinkled with mothers who were women of ill repute. But God's redemptive power was able to elevate them to live lives that ultimately honored God. So as we conclude today, let us commit to honoring and upholding the sanctity of motherhood. Not just on this special day, but every day. Let us emulate the virtues of wisdom, kindness, faith, and resilience, exemplified by the mothers of the Bible, and some of our own mothers too. May we always remember that the greatest gift we can give to our mothers is our love, appreciation, and devotion. So in closing, Let's offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the mothers in our lives, seeking God's blessings and guidance as we continue to walk in his light. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.